Hey guys, how's it going? This is Nat Nader. Hey, you're back to hear more of my story, hey? Well, let's take a bit of a dive back into what happened over two months ago. As you can already tell, it's been about two months since I was placed in a mental institution after having murdered what everyone believed to be Kyle. In truth, he was long gone. I'd found his body in a creek two days before the party when I was on a hike in the wooded area behind my house. It was around that time when the voices began giving commands. I was unsure what to do, what to think, and the voices helped me to put all of my worries to rest. I had called out into the forest for someone to help me, and after many tears had been shed, and my body felt heavy like lead, I began to hear the voices in my head. They were very calm and orderly. They instructed me to calm down and to listen to them. They knew what had happened was horrific, but there would be no good if I just stayed there in that forest with my now deceased friend. They told me that the death of my dear friend Kyle and the murder of his imposter would incite a new beginning. At first, I was skeptical of their wisdom, confused as to how Kyle would play a role in me inciting a new world order and a new beginning. But they quickly changed my mind as they showed me their true power. I saw the corpse of my recently deceased friend vanish into dust and be swept away by the wind. The water that had turned crimson red from Kyle's blood had vanished. The wind lifted me up with a strong autumn breeze that formed leaves that lifted me up off the ground. They spoke with fluency and with concern for my well-being. We're here to help you, Rob. I asked them the infamous question. Why would you help me? Your friend was murdered by a psychopathic alien imposter. The real Kyle is dead, and has been replaced by an aggressive, more unfriendly version of Kyle. This false version of Kyle has gained the trust of the Dennings household a very powerful political family. Kyle's father is the governor of Massachusetts, and as such, he would have a lot of political power coming from the governor's family, and this advantage would make it that much easier for him to be elected into power. From there, Kyle could begin to take measures to ensure his ultimate rule over Earth. The imposter wants to use his abilities to take over the world, and the only way to stop him is by exposing him as an alien through death. I don't quite understand. You're telling me that this imposter who's pretending to be Kyle is like some demon alien who wants to take over the world? Exactly. And by killing him, you will gain his powers. And with our help, the world will be yours instead, to rule as you wish. To any other person, this would have sounded like complete lunacy. But after what I just witnessed, they had convinced me. 
they had the power to make my biggest dreams come true. And as long as I listened to them, I would achieve anything I desired. All they asked was my complete devotion. And I gave it to them. Heart, body, and soul. Transition back to the week that they had placed me in my sensory deprivation room. I began to have full conversations with the voices. Any question that I asked, they had the answer to. Why have humans never found peace? There will never be peace amongst humans, for their desire to have free will shall cause humans to clash with the idea of free will that someone else has. Are there really aliens among us? They are too far away from us physically, but some of them can send their distant spirits to us in the form of evil spirits which humans may mistake as demons. Was the imposter I killed really an alien? He was an alien in the sense that he was not a part of this world. He was a demon in human form. He would have killed you if you hadn't killed him first. I continued to ask them questions, and waited patiently as I listened to their answers. Even though I continued to have a feeling in the pit of my stomach that I was being used for some larger purpose, one that extended beyond me. I wasn't sure what that entailed, but I had a feeling that there would be a large cost besides my devotion, for all of the power that they give me. After about a week within the room, I decided that enough was enough. I wanted out. The voices instructed me on how to break free of my straitjacket, and then told me to wait until the assistants arrived. I waited until the regular assistants came to bring me my dinner, and the voices instructed me how to knock each one of them out. I did so with speed and agility. They directed me down the right hallways, through the proper exits, and I made it out of the facility with little incident. Any normal person would have called it a miracle but I give all of the credit to the voices. I decided to go home, but when I came home, I found a horrific scene and someone I didn't expect. I saw the walls splattered with blood. The house was covered in blood. It was almost as if the walls were covered in wet paint. I looked everywhere for my parents, but all that I found was their leftover skulls placed next to each other, with two crossed bones right below them on the floor. I still don't know what happened to them, but I knew in that moment I had to escape what was in that house lest they kill me as well. I wasn't sure what to do, so I called the police in to let them know that someone had killed my parents. The police were puzzled by the crime scene, and even more puzzled of me calling them in after having escaped a high security mental hospital. They decided to put me in custody again, as a prime suspect in their murder. But after two weeks, that was ruled out. Prisoners never really approached me, 
to show friendship or to try and take my food tray. They saw me as the next coming of the devil or something like that. The voices decided that this time I was supposed to lie about no longer hearing their orders to the prosecutors. That way, they would release me from my sentencing under good behavior and a sane mind. During the prosecution, the voices told me to focus my mind on the judge and voice mentally the ruling that would let me go free. And just like that, the judge and jury ruled in my favor, and I was free. I had fallen into a lighter form of depression, but the voices always kept me company. I was put up for adoption, and a family actually decided to adopt a 15-year-old. Not only that, but they were a very wealthy and powerful family at that. I couldn't believe it. They took me in, with little recourse on their decision, and decided that they would enroll me in a private school for talented kids. I was still technically a freshman in high school, so I was able to be enrolled in. However, the rumors about my act upon the imposter version of Kyle quickly spread around the school. People would bully me, call me a cannibal, but in spite of all this, I actually made a friend. Her name was Kelly, and she was my class's representative. She told me it was her duty to welcome any new students, but in spite of it being her job to welcome me in, she was the only person who understood my struggle, who understood that what I did didn't make me a bad person. After having lost my best friend and my parents, I actually feel a stronger sense of confidence in myself. Maybe what the voices were talking about was true, and that I would be able to rule the world. I've been at this school for about a month, and I've begun to notice something rather strange. Certain students who were put in detention didn't ever come back to the school. No one saw them leave, and they never came back. No one knew what happened to them. About two days ago, the voices told me to go and investigate the situation. Even after my new adopted parents told me to stay out of trouble, here was a problem that only I could solve. I decided to find a way to get myself into detention. Kelly insisted that I didn't, or she would never see me again. I reassured her that I would make it back, and that I would settle this once and for all. I ended up in detention after having knocked down a stupid poster about how going on a road trip would be fun and running through the halls with it, screaming out, Poster bail! I was in the detention room for several hours. I waited as all of the other students and staff had left. It was only me, and one of the history professors, Mr. Hardo. Hardo was always a creepy man, and many students feared getting sent to detention because they'd always deal with him. There were only two students who escaped his clutches, but the voices told me to walk straight into the mouth of the beast so as to speak. 
I saw the clock in the corner of the room hit 6pm. And for the first time, I heard Mr. Hardell speak. Mr. Vanderbilt. Um, sir. It's Siverstein. Rob Siverstein. He lifts up a document with what I assume to be my name written on it. Ah, yes. That was my mistake. Your adoptive parents wrote down their name as your last name. But I see your original name now. I was a bit questioning of his motives. But the voices told me to prepare for the worst. I was in the den of the beast. And I wasn't about to escape so quickly. I wanted to ask you a question before you leave tonight. I nodded to indicate that he was free to speak. What is your opinion on cannibalism? He saw the shocked expression it left on my face. I'm only asking because I heard about your case of insane manslaughter. You did eat your friend's heart, didn't you? I was hesitant to respond to him, but the voices told me to answer. Yes, I did. Oh, splendid. Then I hope you understand the predicament you're in, and what I plan to do with you, right? I nodded to him. His grotesque face grinned with excitement. He stands up with excitement. I've had many types of children. Black, Mexican, Asian, white. But I've never had a kid who has eaten another kid. He opens a closet door within his classroom and piles of bones and leftover human meat, packaged into Ziploc baggies, tumbled out of the closet. Ah, the true face of a cannibal, unfazed by human remains falling out of a closet. The voices began to give commands to me in my head. Continue with the conversation and reach for the scissors in your backpack. Break them in half, and have the blade prepared for when Hardow is within arm's reach. Uh, no, sir. It doesn't faze me a bit. I'm curious as to why you would want to eat me, however. Your meat is a delicacy, my boy. The meat of another cannibal. This is when Hardow moved his grotesque body close to the desk I was sitting in. And I do not plan on letting this opportunity go to waste. He reached into his right pocket and pulled out a pocket knife. But he was too slow. I slashed directly at his neck, stunning him and making him tumble backward. I then stabbed both of his eyes to prevent him from seeing where I was going. I grabbed my backpack and flung myself out of the door of the classroom. I shut the door quickly behind me. Just like before, I called 911 and requested police assistance. Paramedics barely made it in time to save Hardow's life, and the human meat he had collected was confiscated. The police ruled my actions as an act of self-defense against an inhuman serial killer. The cannibal in my school's days was numbered, and I went to school the next day, with everyone welcoming me in open arms saying I was the hero of the academy. I became a protector in their eyes. I became someone to look up to. 
I became someone who could lead with bravery. The voices changed my life. I now have a loving adoptive family. A new school where everyone knows and accepts me. And I always have these powerful voices keeping me company. I'm thankful for everything that I have and am looking forward to completing high school in the next few years. The voices have helped me so much. Their influence and power have gotten me this far. So I'm curious as to where it will take me next.